Hello and welcome. And thank you for joining us today for our webinar, National Models of Asthma Care, Best Practices from the 2019 Asthma Award Winners. This is a web-based presentation sponsored by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. My name is Tracy Mitchell, and I'm a registered respiratory therapist and certified asthma educator in the Indoor Environments Division of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C. And it is my pleasure to join you today as your facilitator uh, for today's webinar. I'm excited to introduce you to EPA's 2019 Asthma Award winners. Today we have with us Mobile Care Foundation, Mobile Care Chicago Asthma Vans. This is a unique program, a unique mobile program providing health care throughout the city of Chicago. Our second winner is Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance Asthma In-Home Response Program. Um, this is a community-based asthma program reaching dis disproportionately affected children with asthma in Omaha. And our third winner is the Rhode Island Department of Health Asthma Control Program Home Asthma Response Program, or HARP. Uh, this is the state health department who's been expanding their services throughout the state of Rhode Island. Uh, so there you can see uh, the teams. Uh, we have representatives from each program here today to share their experience and their award-winning uh, successes with you. So now that we uh, know a little bit about our speakers, and we'll hear more about them in a minute, um, I'd like to hear who's in our audience today. So if you would please answer our first polling question, what type of organization do you represent? Please click on the answer that best describes uh, the organization, whether it's government agency, healthcare provider, health plan, community-based program, or other. Great. So about a third represent a government agency. Uh, we've got about a quarter that uh, describe themselves as others, so that's interesting. Um, but we've got good representation from community-based programs and healthcare providers and even a few health plans. So this is great. Th these are the audiences that represent uh, comprehensive, the best in comprehensive asthma care, and I'm confident that no matter what organization you represent, uh, you'll take away something from our speakers today that will help your asthma program. So speaking of our takeaways, uh, what are we uh, all about today and what are our learning objectives? So today, participants will hear successful strategies from the winners of the 2019 award, successful strategies for addressing asthma triggers, for engaging community health workers, and for pursuing program sustainability. Um, you'll also learn how building partnerships with community organizations, including local school districts, strengthens community ties and improves comprehensive care. Uh, you'll understand how to effectively track data to measure key program outcomes and cost savings, and you'll hear how these programs have done that. You'll also discover strategies for pursuing reimbursement through Medicaid and from health plans to help ensure the full continuum of care and to help with program sustainability. I'd just like to take a couple moments to talk about EPA's uh, awards program. The awards pro program is one component of EPA's overall asthma program. And through this award, we're aimed at surfacing success and highlighting success in asthma care to enable to um, more rapidly spread uh, adoption of best practices ac across the country. The National Environmental Leadership Award in Asthma Management is the highest recognition in the country. Uh, it's the highest recognition a program can receive for delivering excellent asthma care, particularly environmental management, as part of comprehensive care. Through a competitive process, which includes a consensus panel of asthma experts across specialties, including other federal agencies like CDC, HUD, and NIH, uh, nonprofit organizations, including America's Health Insurance Plans and the Allergy and Asthma Network, um, and the previous winner, and this year it was Impact DC out of National Children's Medical Center. Um, and so this consensus panel, these experts judge the applications against the published criteria in order to choose the best of the best. Winners receive national recognition through a press release, blogs, and other social media, and are featured on a national webinar like we're doing today. Uh, winners also receive a crystal award and an opportunity to serve as mentors to other programs throughout the country to help them achieve impactful results. Winners also receive a place on 
Asthma Community Network.org's Hall of Fame. Today's winners join 43 other health plans, healthcare providers, and communities in action who have been recognized over the past 15 years or so for their best practices and best successful approaches to delivering comprehensive asthma care. Um, I invite you all to, uh, at some point, visit asthmacommunitynetwork.org and the Hall of Fame to learn more about all of our previous award winners. So I think if you're joining us today, you know why this work is so important. You know about why asthma is such an important health issue. And you'll hear local statistics from each of our winners, but we know that nationally, asthma remains a public health challenge characterized by disparities. We've made progress to to decrease asthma prevalence, yet there is still a critical need for solutions focused at the state and community levels to address out-of-control asthma, which we know leads to increased costs. There is some good news. CDC reports that some national indicators are improving. Asthma prevalence among children has decreased slightly, and we know that between 2003 and 2013, asthma-related hospitalizations and missed school days actually decreased. Yet important health disparities continue. Children living below the poverty line experience the most emergency department visits, missed school days, and hospitalizations. These high utilizers with uncontrolled asthma drive up the cost to over $50 billion each year. But the good news is we know how to treat and manage asthma. Uh, Science informs policy and forms the foundation of EPA's asthma program. And science tells us that along with medical management, there's strong evidence based and supporting national guidelines that recognize the role of environmental triggers and their remediation as an important part of comprehensive asthma management. We know that eliminating common indoor triggers like tobacco smoke, pet dander, mold, cockroaches, and dust mites results in decreased symptoms and asthma episodes and improved health outcomes for people with asthma. We also know that home visits are a critical care component that we need to address, particularly for at-risk populations. Home visits provide one-on-one time for families and um, helps them to figure out tailored approaches to addressing asthma triggers and to ultimately help control their child's asthma. As technical experts in the built environment and health, EPA has led the federal effort through non-regulatory strategies that enable communities to deliver and sustain in-home environmental asthma care aimed at ensuring access. And so ultimately, EPA supports widespread delivery of in-home environmental interventions because it reduces healthcare costs, increases savings, and expands healthcare workforce. EPA also developed a system for delivering high-quality asthma care, which features essential components to developing an effective and sustainable asthma program. The system you see on the screen is a conceptual framework based on results of the Asthma Health Outcomes Project conducted by the University of Michigan several years ago. This project identified the core elements of successful asthma programs and the processes that drive their implementation, continuous improvement, and endurance. The five key drivers you see highlighted in the circles in the middle of the screen are committed leaders and champions, strong community ties, integrated healthcare services, tailored environmental interventions, and high-performing collaboration. So just to like to uh, ask our second polling question at this point, based on those five uh, key drivers that I just described and they're listed there for you, please select which of the following best practices or key drivers you're currently employing in your work. And you can choose all that apply to your program. Oh, great. This is very exciting. So over half of you are strongly connected to your community. Over half of you are providing integrated services. Almost half are providing tailored environmental interventions. Many of you have high-performing collaborations and committed leaders and champions. So that's great. There's always room for improvement, right? So there's at least 50% of you in each one of those categories that uh, can, can learn something today and will learn something today. Uh, So as I said, today's award-winning programs um, exemplify all of the key drivers that we talked about, and I invite you to be listening for how these program components show up 
in unique and different ways in each program. And so now, we are, I'm excited to introduce our first speakers from Mobile Care Chicago. We'll be hearing from Matt Seamer. Matt is the Executive Director of Mobile Care Chicago. Matt's received his Master's Degree of Arts and Philosophy from Duke University, and he joined Mobile Care Chicago in 2012 and assumed the position of Executive Director in 2016. Joining Matt is Amy Bain. Amy has her BSN from Indiana University and completed her master's degree in nursing at Rush University. Uh, she's been a pediatric nurse for 14 years and a pediatric nurse practitioner for nine of those years. And Amy joined Mobile Care Chicago in 2012. Welcome, Matt and Amy. Thank you, Tracy. And um, yeah, thank you to, to the EPA for this honor and for allowing us to be, participate in this webinar. And um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about Mobile Care Chicago in a couple different ways, just sort of how our program got started and the way that we've grown our program over time to innovate into different models of care for kids who have severe asthma. And then Amy is also going to talk specifically about our clinical model and how we sort of stage our interventions. Okay, so Mobile Care was founded in 1999 by, by four physicians, but primarily by Dr. Phil Sheridan, uh, who was a chest surgeon, and his son is a pulmonologist. His son-in-law is a allergist, and so he was heavily involved in lung health at the time and went out to Los Angeles and visited the Breathmobile uh, out there, which was the first one in the country, founded in 1994, and really liked that model. We the the basis of what we do is um, still comes from a foundation of a of a breath mobile model, and then we've just sort of uh, adapted it to our needs here in Chicago. All right, uh, we have uh, two asthma vans currently. They rotate through 47 different partner school sites. We do a little over 2,700 patient visits per year, and our program is more about follow-up care, about 85% of what we do is follow-up visits, and it's very labor-intensive. So we expect to see all of our patients three times a year on average, and most kids stay with their asthma van for seven years right now. So a lot of what we do is seeing the same kids a lot. Yeah, so in 2013, we really got into home environment assessments, and we started working with an emergency department here in the city of Chicago that had a lot of pediatric cases of asthma and working with them and using a community health worker model, we were able to reduce emergency department visits for pediatric cases in that particular hospital by 84%. That was over a three year period and was really the driver behind what we do now, which is an integrated approach in all of the neighborhoods that we go into. As I said, so our, our asthma vans were our core program, our sort of flagship program. We have two of those that rotate through the city of Chicago and into the uh, collar suburbs. We have a dental van, a portable dental clinic. It's a pop-up clinic. It can be set up inside of schools. And then we also do our home assessment program through our Department of Patient Services. And so they really manage all of the most severe cases of asthma that we see. I wanted to step back just a little bit and talk about why in Chicago this particular model made sense, especially over a 20-year period. There's been a lot of research in Chicago about the number of kids who have asthma and uh, where they're concentrated. So in a lot of our low-income areas, over 25% of kids have asthma. In one neighborhood in particular, 33% of kids have asthma based on the latest research. It's the number one cause of pediatric ED visits here in the city, and also the number one cause of school absenteeism, according to Chicago Public Schools. And alarmingly, so when mobile care first started, asthma, uh, we were the, the number one city in the country for asthma fatalities. We've now been demoted to number two. I would prefer that we not make a top 10 on that list. So we still have a lot of work to do. But that's one of the drivers for why this program remains so important um, and why we continue to adapt it into these communities. All right, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transition it over to Amy to talk about our, um, our care practice. Hi, so this slide is an overview of our model of care, which I'll explain in more detail over the next few slides. 
Our model of care begins with surveying. The majority of our patients are obtained through surveying the student body of our participating sites on an annual basis. We provide the sites with the attached parent handout that asks five questions and states if they answered yes to any of the questions, then their child may have symptoms of asthma and gives the parent the option of a no-cost evaluation and treatment by checking the box. We provide services to children ages six months to 19 years of age and receive many referrals from existing patients and primary care providers within the community. Therefore, not all of our patients that are seen at the various sites are current students at the school. After surveys are collected and an initial patient visit is scheduled. After brief introduction of our program, the first appointment is underway. Our bilingual MA collects the medical information from the parent. She obtains data on lifetime history of emergency room visits missed school days, and hospital admissions. This information is also obtained at each subsequent visit. Meanwhile, the driver obtains the vitals, conducts spirometry and pheno on the patient, and requests the parent or patient to fill out the asthma control test or ACT. The provider determines if a post spirometry is necessary and discusses the diagnostic results with the parent, as well as the diagnosis determined at the initial visit. The parent is educated on the triggers and symptoms of asthma, as well as an abbreviated pathophysiology of asthma. They are also educated on the difference between a controller and a quick relief medication, and a handout is given at that, that addresses all this information as well. An asthma action plan is also created for the child and reviewed with the parent. The patient and parent practices using the age-appropriate spacer and other medical devices. A treatment plan is developed for the patient and reviewed with the parent. We discussed with the parents that a follow-up appointment in one month with an allergy skin test is recommended. So this is one of our patients performing pheno. We have had pheno for about nine months on both of our asthma bands, and it has helped with our patient compliance as it gives, gives our patients and their parents a tangible value for airway inflammation. And this is one of our newer patients. Um, he, his mother actually saw our van parked in front of one of the schools. Um, and knocked on the door and asked if she could have her son be seen because she was worried about him. Um, at the time, he didn't have any health insurance and she had nowhere else to go. So we um, took her information and we called her and we scheduled her for appointment um, and he was diagnosed with asthma. Um, so we, in this picture, we're teaching the mom how to use the spacer with masks correctly. So we returned to our model of care that shows after the initial visit, we provide ongoing treatment and home assessments, then back to resurveying the following year. We strive to provide continuity of care on the asthma van with the goal to see patients back within one to two months of their initial appointment. And as Matt mentioned, the majority of our patients stay with their asthma van for six years or more, averaging three follow-up visits per year. We offer parents the opportunity of, or I'm sorry, the option of physically coming to their child's appointment or having a virtual visit through either FaceTime or Skype if they're not able to miss work or have other obligations, making it difficult to be physically present at their appointment. We rolled out virtual visits about a year ago at a few pilot schools and are now conducting them at all of our sites. Parents appreciate the flexibility. We have, e we have even been able to see a patient when she was having an asthma exacerbation and her mother was in the ICU for kidney failure. At the follow-up visit, it is determined if the patient is receiving adequate treatment. The appointment is also utilized to review medication and information and to obtain an allergy skin test. 85% of pediatric asthma is due to allergies. Therefore, we provide allergy skin tests, typically at the second clinic visit, testing for the most common allergens in the Chicago area. And we'll repeat testing as needed on an annual basis. At every visit, we review the asthma action plan and recommend a home assessment if appropriate. So this picture is an example of the extensive treatment performed on the asthma van. We have two brothers here. Um, the younger one near the window is receiving an albuterol nut treatment for an asthma exacerbation while his brother is receiving an allergy skin test. And here are two more siblings that we see on the asthma van. And I wanted to share with you the baby story who I'll refer to as E. So we started seeing E when he was about 10 months old after his mother learned of our program through her sister, his kids we also see on the van. We treat his three-year-old brother um, who's standing next to him in the picture. He was born at 36 weeks gestation and, was, and started having respiratory difficulties and congestion around one month of age. Prior to coming to the asthma van, he had been taken to the emergency room twice for respiratory distress and was admitted after each of the emergency room visits. At four months of age, he was admitted to the intensive care unit requiring intubation for three days, and he was again admitted to the hospital at seven months of age for respiratory distress where he was admitted overnight for a week. When he came to the asthma van, 
The mother stated he had a bad cough, wheezing, daily congestion, and occasional retractions and respiratory distress. She said that she couldn't sleep at night due to worrying about her baby being able to breathe and had, to ha- and had him sleeping either in his car seat or on a wedge at all times. She had mentioned this to her primary care provider, but was not referred to a specialist. After meeting E and his mother, we started him on a daily controller medication and ed- educated the mother about the medication and his symptoms. She was instructed when to use the medications and how often. Since his first visit over two years ago, he has not required additional emergency room visits or hospitalizations. And now when he gets sick, his symptoms are well controlled and only last a few days. The mother states his symptoms have resolved and he no longer has wheezing or retraction. The mother says she's very happy regarding the services her sons have received and agreed to have her son's story shared. So we conduct telemedicine calls to follow up on our patients on a regular basis. We have found regular contact with the patient and families has improved our medication appointment compliance. A community health worker goes into our patient's homes to do a thorough assessment. We like this to occur after an allergy skin test has been conducted so that we are aware of what the child is allergic to. The CHW is looking for any environmental factors that could worsen our patient's asthma symptoms. She provides education and resources for what she finds during the assessment. Some of the products that are given to our parents patients and their parents. Free of charge include allergy mattress and pillow covers, bed frames, mattresses, furnace filters, air purifiers, air conditioners, dehumidifiers, green cleaning kits, and vacuum cleaners. So um, the photo in the top right corner shows how um, when the CHW walked into the house, she found um, where the boys were sleeping, which was on an air mattress in the middle of the living room. Um, So their bedroom was full of, um, I guess, just uh, and they didn't have anywhere to sleep and um, the father said I think they had to get rid of their beds we're not sure why but so we were able to help clear out the clutter in their bedroom and provided them with new bed frames mattresses and an air filter which you can see in the middle of the bed um, and the boys were super excited to now be able to sleep um, in their own bedroom and you can see them uh, there each of the boys are on their bed there. Try to ignore the fact that the dog is on the bed. We did tell them that that was not advice. Okay, so you know, as you can see, a lot of a lot of what we do and a lot of the success of this particular program has to do with just an intensive amount of labor that happens for you know patients who have a lot of ED visits, trips to the ICU, missed days of school, and might not live in a neighborhood where they have easy access to see a specialist or even a primary care provider in some cases. But I'd be remiss if I didn't also say that the reason why we're able to do this work is because we also have strong partnerships with the American Lung Association, the Chicago chapter here, which is very strong and helps us cover the cost of the remediation uh, when we do home assessments. The University of Illinois at Chicago, and in particular, their Department of Epidemiology, which has long been a partner on research grants and helped us get our uh, community health worker program started in 2013. Our local school sites, as I said, we have 47 different partner schools, and all of them volunteer in this work and, and, and do it you know, willingly because they see the benefit of it. And then also the Chicago Asthma Consortium, which is our sort of local group here that promulgates uh, best practices for asthma uh, and asthma management and also does uh, quite a bit of convening among the different stakeholders who can affect asthma and can ultimately lead us to change. And I also wanted to point out one of our partners, uh, Perfect Air, who's relatively new. They've been working with us for about a year now. Local company that manufactures and distributes air conditioners and dehumidifiers and um, gave us a, a generous donation of quite a few including uh, some that we were able to give out to our partner school sites that don't have air conditioning. That was one way that we could try to make sure that schools also know that we care about the air quality in those particular spaces. Uh, We obviously recognize that children spend a lot of time there. And so this was at Visitation Elementary, which is one of our school sites, and they seemed um, pretty happy to get some air conditioners and some dehumidifiers. We pulled out our data for one full year. This is direct from our electronic medical record database. And so in aggregate, our baseline for our kids who are coming through for the first time, you'll notice that less than half did not go to an ER in the last year before coming to their asthma van. 19% had been hospitalized for asthma 
and less than half qualified as well-controlled on an ACT. And so that's sort of where we're at when, when patients come in. This is where they are a year later. Those are those exact same patients. And you can see that, you know, only 6% went back to an ED, 2% went back uh, or were hospitalized. Now three quarters qualify as well-controlled. You know, one of the things that we talked about in particular with, with the EPA is that for every $3 that's spent in prevention or, or towards the asthma van, or I'm sorry, for every dollar that's, that's spent, um, we save $3 in the health system. And this is not data that we put together. This is, we actually asked the Illinois Department of Public Health um, to uh, get us some sort of data just on the savings in ER visits um, and hospitalizations alone. And this is what they came back with. And then I'd just like to end our presentation with Christopher, this particular patient, who started coming to us when he was an infant. And the reason that I like to talk about his story is because this is really what we want for, for every child in our communities. Um, Christopher has severe asthma. And in his entire time that he's been coming to the asthma van, he has not been to the ER. He has not been to the hospital. He misses less than the national average uh, for days of school. And so even though he has a very severe case of asthma, it's not affecting his life. And he plays sports. He plays three different sports and is perfectly healthy. And so that's what we're really striving for. That's the goal of this program is to try to make sure that we get kids as young as possible, make sure that the diagnosis is correct, that they're put on a treatment plan that works, and that they can thrive in their everyday lives uh, without thinking about this chronic condition. Okay, and then uh, just briefly, this is our summary. We reach about uh, 20,000 families annually through the screenings that we do for asthma. We have over 100 school partners in mobile care generally. This is including the dental side of our operation. And then of course, our, our goal is comprehensive care for the, the leading driver of uh, healthcare costs for children and for school absenteeism. Thank you again to Tracy and to the EPA for um, allowing us to share this program and this particular model. And I look forward to answering any questions if people have them. So thank you. Fabulous, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Amy. Um, what a great example of strong community ties and high performing collaboration and uh, really some impressive return on investment data. So thank you, thank you both. Our next presenter is Ian Sheets from the Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance. So uh, Ian is a native uh, to Omaha, Nebraska. He uh, has been with the Asthma In-Home Response or Project AIR program for about three and a half years. He is currently pursuing his master's degree in administration. And again, he's at the Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance, a nonprofit that focuses on ensuring children's health through healthy homes. So welcome, Ian. Thanks, Tracy. So yeah, like Tracy said, uh, my name is Ian Sheets. I'm the grants manager at Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance. Uh, we are a children's environmental health nonprofit that was started in 2006 out of Omaha's residential Superfund site. It's the largest residential Superfund site in the nation. Uh, and that Superfund site was designated by the EPA because of high levels of lead contamination in the soil. So Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance was started as sort of a community education response to that designation. But in 2010, we started realizing that going into houses with problems with lead, we were noticing a lot of other issues that also needed to be addressed, things like mold, uh, pests, moisture, intrusion, things like that. So uh, kind of pivoted to holistic healthy housing in 2010, but we still do a lot of lead poisoning prevention education. But as part of that uh, shift, we really started focusing on indoor air quality. Really the focus of our work is like Tracy said, uh, making sure that kids are living in healthy homes. So we try to tackle environmental health through the built environment. Um, like I said, we still do community-wide education um, on all sorts of healthy housing topics through a lot of different initiatives. Um, but I am here today to talk to you all about our asthma in-home response program, or uh, we at like to call it Project AIR. Started in 2015 as a partnership with Kresge Foundation. They were doing a 
series of pilots across the nation on multi-component or as we call it multi-layer, multi-trigger in-home asthma interventions. So we're working with a bunch of other organizations across the country on their programs at the same time. And ours really got its foothold in the community after that pilot was done. So we've been going strong since then. And the components that we focus on are the behaviors of the family. And those aren't just reducing negative behaviors, but also increasing positive behaviors. And I'll go into that in a little bit. You know, just basic education about asthma triggers and asthma medication, supply provision, so making sure the families have the things that they need to um, take care of the triggers inside their house, and then also knowing how to use them, providing free construction to the families uh, if possible, so getting rid of things that exacerbate asthma, so whether that's fixing an active leak or installing ventilation systems, and then finally providing referrals and triage care to other organizations, making sure that families can focus on the other issues that they have that might be out of our wheelhouse. So we serve, it says here about 50 kids a year. That's really more 50 homes a year is what we've been aiming for recently. Sometimes we'll serve a family that has more than one kid with asthma. So uh, that number, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. So this is just a brief breakdown of the program. First uh, family is referred to us either through word of mouth or an outreach event or a formal partnership. We do a quick intake, just make sure that the family knows what our services are and make sure that we know as much about the family as we need to before we go into the house. We have an, an initial visit where we provide some education and do an environmental, environmental evaluation of the house. And then later we come back and drop off supplies. And then later than that, if we can, we provide construction and uh, do some follow-up visits after the construction is completed. So kind of a more zeroed in look at the visit that we conduct uh, initially. It's a full scale, full scale environmental assessment. So our inspectors are trained in healthy housing, um, indoor air quality, you know, measurement of environmental hazards. And they look at everything for all of our healthy home assessments as we call them. But for air families especially, we look at um, the quality of the air and the hazards kind of as they pertain to the kids triggers. And so while we have one inspector doing that assessment of the house, we have another inspector or staff member conducting education and getting some baseline information about the child's asthma. During that, we also provide some pretty simple general information and education about asthma, some things that the, the parents might not know, uh, build some rapport with the client, make sure that they know that we're there to help and that you know we'll be following up with them pretty regularly. Um, and then we start to establish some potential referrals. So if it seems like there's a partner that we have out there that immediately could start helping the family, we'll be able to help them contact them in the field. And then at the end of that visit, so when the person is done, when the staff member is done performing their assessment and the other staff member is done collecting that baseline information and uh, providing that education, they both kind of meet in the middle with the family, talk about the findings of the assessment of the house as you know, those kind of correlate with the triggers that the educator established during their questionnaire and then kind of work with the family and talk about next steps and then kind of go back to the office. The next part of the process is um, both of those staff members work together on making sure that the supplies that are provided to the family are you know, appropriate and relevant to the child's asthma triggers. So there is a baseline of materials that we do bring to every family, but then you know, if we notice that there is a cockroach infestation, um, we will add some, um, maybe some roach bait and some education about pests, integrated pest management. We also look at the family's needs. So if they need mattress covers, for example, for example, we'll uh, make sure that we bring those, bring furnace filters based on the furnace size. Um, and then, you know, also just taking a look at the home's health and providing some specific supplies to um, mitigate any hazards that the home might be presenting. And then we bring those supplies to the family, make sure that they understand how to use the supplies, when to use the supplies, um, make sure that they know how to put the furnace filter in the right way, for example, things like that, um, and just kind of educate them based on those supplies and grounded in those supplies. And we uh, track all the costs of those specific supplies because that helps us establish our return on investment uh, when we do our internal kind of assessment of the program. So I'm not going to take too much time on this slide because there's a lot of um, information here, but I 
definitely recommend that you come back and look at this once it's once the whole presentation is posted. Um, but these are kind of the four main areas that we break down our evaluation. So the first is asthma severity and the top left kind of quadrant. Uh, on the top right, we look at the quality of life of the family, um, and that's through self-report of the family uh, and of the parents. Bottom left, we look at the behavior of the family, so how often they do things like vacuuming and dusting. Um, and then bottom right, we take a look at the actual home's health and safety along the eight principles of a healthy home. These are all measures that we conduct both at the beginning, six months after the interventions completed, and then 12 months after the interventions completed as well to kind of get a, a story of how our intervention affected a family and then in aggregate all of our families. And then we also do quite a bit of internal um, assessment, just making sure that our program is consistent and that um, you know we're not all over the map in terms of the quality of service that we're providing or the cost of the service that we're providing. So these are some of the things that we look at internally. Um, you know, how often we're enrolling families for more than one program within our organization, how much the cost per intervention is, um, both on average and you know just in specific cases. We look at the cost of supplies as part of that. We look at how um, how many families we're able to follow up with, how often or how long families are staying within our program, how long our construction projects take, how many referrals we make, and where we make those referrals to. So those are all really important to us to kind of see the health of the program and make decisions um, as we move forward. These are some health and quality of life outcomes um, for 55 clients as part of a study that we recently did with um, a local university, uh, the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So the paper hasn't been published yet, but we got these results actually just a week or so before we received the award. So we're really excited to share them. In the middle column, we have the aggregate pre-intervention numbers for each of the um, things in the, the left and most col column. Um, so for example, these are the first row. The, these are the collective symptomatic days for those 55 clients um, in the uh, two weeks before our intervention even started. So that's part of the baseline information we collected. And then six months after our intervention, we collected that same information. How many symptomatic, st symptomatic days did your child have in the two weeks before we asked this follow-up? And so those numbers dropped pretty significantly from 131 to 11. And if we you know, go down the row, I'm not going to read them all out, but you can kind of see those same kind of dramatic reductions, um, also you know, very similar to what mobile care saw. Um, missed school days went down. Missed work days as a result of those missed school days went down. Emergency department visits went down, and so did hospitalizations. And as part of a, an original partnership we had with a, a managed care organization, we found that the um, return on investment for our interventions resulted in a dollar and eighty-three cents for every dollar that we invested. And so we're trying to really push that number up as we reduce the cost of our services and also increase the quality. These are some of the behavioral outcomes that we see. So like I said, we not only try to in, like augment good behaviors, but also mitigate bad behaviors or negative behaviors. So try to encourage our families to dust more and vacuum more and change their furnace filter more often and consistently. And we find that, you know, after our brief education, you know, it just takes a couple minutes to show them, for example, how and when to uh, change a furnace filter. We see significant increases in all those positive behaviors, and we also see significant decreases in some negative behaviors. So smoking indoors, using harsh cleaning chemicals, and using candles and air fresheners, those are all just very simple, small changes that the family makes. The smoking indoors one is one that we're really excited about because as part of our program, we require that our families stop smoking indoors, and that's a really hard habit to break. You know, it's not that they're not smoking at all, but even just going outside uh, can be a pretty, pretty significant challenge, especially, you know, in the winters in Nebraska can get pretty rough. So that's one that we're really excited about. And then here we just have some photos of the kind of work that we do. Um, this is a surround that was replaced. As you can see, there's some pretty significant mold uh, in the corners uh, and on the walls of the shower. Uh, as well as no ventilation in the bathroom. You can't really see it on the left side picture, but there wasn't a ventilation system in there. Uh, on the right side, we not only installed a vent fan above that light, but um, installed a whole new surround and made sure that the leaking that was causing the mold um, was taken care of, as well as educating the family on you know, wiping down the surfaces after a shower or a bath and making sure that the vent fan is on during uh, a shower and a bath, which, you know, as you all probably know, can go a long way. 
And this is uh, sort of a picture of one of our cleanouts that we do. So sometimes we will go into a house where there's significant work that we can do on the indoor air quality through a small construction intervention, whether that's cleaning a furnace out or you know, getting rid of some mold, but our contractors can't actually get into the problem areas of the house safely. So then we can enlist some community, some volunteers from the community to work with the family. We bring out a free dumpster, bring in, you know, a team of four or five people and a couple of staff and really work through the uh, cleaning out those areas with the family. And so not only does that allow our contractors to go in and do the work that they need to do, it also, um, you know, reducing the clutter in that house allows the air to circulate better and just improves the indoor air quality in general. This is just a list of some of the partnerships we have and the types of partnerships we have. So we have a couple of reimbursement models that we're um, currently working with and on. Some of those are direct and some of those are partial, but that's really exciting for us because that's a model that um, is pretty progressive and hard to accomplish um, and set up. So, you know, we've been really diligent about respecting and nurturing those relationships. Um, these are, you know, either healthcare providers or managed care organizations that are seeing the kind of returns that we have seen and they are interested in investing in the health of our community um, because honestly it reduces the load on their system. So uh, we also have this Nebraska Asthma Coalition, which is a just a partnership of a lot of stakeholders uh, in Omaha and in Nebraska, frankly, in terms of um, asthma or just respiratory or air quality in general. So getting a lot of the people in the room that care the most and then making sure that we can triage or work with them when it's relevant. We've got some corporate sponsors. One of those is AWARE. Um, that's an indoor air quality monitor company. They are trying to, you know, make those residential and commercial indoor air quality monitors a thing. So they wanted to kind of show how they work um, in our families' homes. We have some government partnerships. So City of Omaha is a big one. We do a lot of healthy home uh, construction with them as part of their lead remediation program. Um, we work pretty closely with Children's Hospital of Missouri. You know, we do a lot of mentorship with them. They train us, we train them. We provide equipment for them. They um, trade equipment back to us. It's really great um, back and forth that we have with them. And then just you know more healthcare providers, just simple referrals. And then finally that university I mentioned earlier, we really work a lot on the um, research and internal evaluation of our program with uh, the students and physicians there that um, do research on their day-to-day -day anyway. And these are kind of our next steps. So this is where we see ourselves going and where we want to go. So we would um, very much like to duplicate our model in other places. Uh, we think that the house is kind of the linchpin of health for kids uh, because kids spend so much time in their homes. Uh, we want to continue to expand this reimbursement model that we've been working on. We see it in a lot of other places and we want to kind of demonstrate that there is a return so consistently that it's almost irresponsible for healthcare providers and managed care organizations to not invest in the model. We need to get a lot more efficient in terms of sharing our claims data um, and making sure that that's done securely and in a way that respects the privacy of our uh, clients. We want to scale up our individual services. So moving from 50 homes to 75 or 100 or 200 homes, um, just in our in terms of our own program. And then, you know, we've really been working on this community-wide automated referral system. So the idea being that a family might not know what services are out there, but they know what they need. So in putting that into an automated form online, it then, you know, sends itself to different organizations and makes sure that they um, can get service from programs that they might not know are, are out there. So those are some of our priorities over the next couple of years. Um, and that's actually my whole presentation. So uh, I'm looking forward to your guys' questions. And if you, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me directly as well if you uh, want to talk more. And thanks again to the EPA for having this whole presentation. It's very exciting to us as, as an organization. Great. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, Project AIR, what a great example of tailored environmental interventions and an impressive evaluation and, and ROI uh, data as well. Okay, so our last presenter uh, from the Rhode Island Department of Health is Ashley Fogarty. Ashley has a master's degree in public health from the University of Connecticut. Uh, she's been working at 
the Rhode Island Department of Health's asthma control program for about three years. Um, she coordinates services. You're going to hear more about partnerships from her program, and she's involved in various evaluation activities as well. So welcome, Ashley. Thank you, Tracy. All right, so hi, everyone. As Tracy mentioned, my name is Ashley Fogarty, and I will be presenting on behalf of the Rhode Island Department of Health's Asthma Control Program. All right, so this slide shows data among children in Rhode Island, as well as health inequities that currently exist in our state. So it provides a breakdown of asthma-related emergency department visit rates and hospitalizations per 1,000 children under 18 years of age. And it shows that Black and Hispanic children have disproportionately higher rates of ED visits and hospitalizations as compared to white children. Also, uh, our program is focused on the high poverty urban cities in Rhode Island, commonly referred to as the core cities, which includes Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls, and Woonsocket. Among the four core cities, the rate of asthma emergency department visits is almost three times as high as the rest of the state. In later slides, I will be able to provide maps of the state which shows a visual of the core cities as compared to the rest of the state in terms of the burden of asthma. So just to continue here um, with more asthma data and the health inequities for children living in Rhode Island, as mentioned in the previous slide, the burden of asthma falls disproportionately on the urban low-income cities in the state and also falls disproportionately on black and Hispanic children, children living in low-income households and children living in low-income urban neighborhoods. So our program primarily focuses on children with asthma on Medicaid, as over 70% of pediatric asthma ED visits in Rhode Island are children on Medicaid. These maps show children with asthma claims living below poverty, as well as children with asthma claims on Medicaid. So the map on the right shows children on Medicaid with an asthma claim, and the map on the left is a little bit older, but it shows children living below poverty with an asthma claim. Despite these maps being from different time periods, both maps show a similar trend in the high burden areas of asthma, or what we commonly call them the asthma hotspots. So you can see similar trends um, with the high burden areas. Um, on the map on the right, the highest quintile of asthma are the bright red, and same with the dark um, brown color on the map on the left. These maps show asthma emergency department visits among children on Medicaid, and the map on the right highlights the core city areas by a census tract. And um, so this zoomed in map also shows the major highways that cut through the asthma hotspots um, as air pollution from motor vehicle traffic is a major environmental trigger of asthma and something that we're really interested in. Um, and again, um, you can see the core cities here um, that are highlighted. So Central Falls, Pawtucket, Woonsocket, and Providence. So just some more maps. Um, these describe the asthma, poverty, and housing in our state. So they're a little bit older. Um, however, I thought that they were important to include as they are density maps showing children 2 to 17 years of age who have an asthma claim living below poverty. Um, so that is on the left side map. And then children living in low and moderate income affordable housing on the right side. So the housing density map is especially interesting as many of the state's public housing units are located in the areas that are more dense with asthma claims, um, especially in the core cities, like I had mentioned. And if you focus in on the map on the right um, for the city of Pawtucket, the dark red mark on the lower side actually sits directly above the Pawtucket Housing Authority, uh, which is interesting and part of the reason why we currently do a lot of work with public housing facilities in the core cities. Um, so before getting into the details about our specific asthma interventions, I thought that it would be a good idea to give a brief background about the Rhode Island Asthma Control Program. Uh, we are housed in the Division of Community Health and Equity, and we focus on the Rhode Island Department of Health's three leading priority areas, including socioeconomic and environmental determinants of health, eliminating health disparities, and promoting health equity, and to ensure access to health, uh, quality health services. The Rhode Island Asthma Control Program serves children 0 to 17 living in the high poverty urban areas of the state, as I mentioned before. We are well known for long-term partnerships across different sectors, including research, hospitals, public health, housing, environmental, and social justice organizations. So the Rhode Island Asthma Control Program is made up of home-based, school, and clinical asthma interventions. Our two home-based interventions are the Home Asthma Response Program, 
which is a home visiting program, and I will be discussing that in uh, later slides, and the Breathe Easy at Home program, which involves the use of code enforcement inspections if providers feel as though a child's asthma is being exacerbated by the conditions of the rental property in which they're living. For the school-based services, we have Project CASE, which is known as Controlling Asthma in Schools Effectively. This program encompasses Hasbro Children's Hospitals, Draw Breath Asthma Workshops, school trainings for staff, as well as monitoring indoor air quality in schools and promoting the use of asthma action plans and improving care coordination between providers, schools, and families. Okay, so Rhode Island's Home Asthma Response Program. Uh, this program is an evidence-based intervention designed to reduce preventable asthma ED visits and hospitalizations among high-risk pediatric asthma patients. HARP uses certified asthma educators and community health workers to conduct up to three intensive in-home sessions that assess asthma knowledge, provide asthma self-management education, deliver environmental supplies, and improve the quality and experience of care. The Rhode Island Asthma Control Program currently partners with Hasbro Children's Hospital and St. Joseph Health Center to provide home visits. HARP eligibility is based on the child's age, city of residence, the level of asthma control, and their use of the healthcare system. So this slide shows the HARP screening tool for um, eligibility into the program. Um, so if you look at the um, diagram, children with two or more asthma-related emergency department visits or one inpatient asthma hospitalization, or if they have poorly controlled asthma, meaning that they experience asthma symptoms on a daily basis, are generally referred to participate in the full HARP package. Um, so full HARP means that they would be getting up to three intensive in-home sessions with the certified asthma educator and the community health worker. With the full HARP package, participants also receive environmental supplies as needed, um, such as HEPA vacuums, cleaning supplies, mattress covers, food storage, containers, um, et cetera, in addition to instruction for remediation of environmental triggers. Other children with, um, if they have either less emergency department visits um, or their asthma is um, not well controlled, they might receive um, the one in-home visit or be referred to participate in Hasbro's Draw Breath workshop, which takes place either at the hospital or sometimes in schools. Rhode Island was selected to be part of CDC's 618 initiative in 2016, which targets six common and costly health conditions with 18 proven interventions. The purpose of the 618 initiative is to promote the adoption of evidence-based interventions in collaboration with healthcare purchasers, payers, and providers. So through our participation with 618, uh, we participated in the first cohort and um, we had discussions on reimbursement of the costs of asthma home visiting services. The Rhode Island Asthma Control Program submitted a HARP budget initiative as part of its 618 work, which is one of many program efforts to get statewide Medicaid coverage of HARP for pediatric asthma patients with poorly controlled asthma. The Rhode Island 618 Asthma Control Team convened state government officials, providers, and insurers together to propose a business case for making HARP a Medicaid reimbursable service. We also worked with primary care providers participating in Rhode Island's Patient-Centered Medical Home Project, which now has 73 practice sites serving more than 320,000 Rhode Island residents to implement asthma guidelines-based care. As shown in previous slides, through our participation with 618, we were able to use claims data to map HARP-eligible Medicaid members showing a disproportionate cost burden for a small population of high asthma utilizers. We developed the HARP infographic as shown in previous slides, showing a positive return on investment, presented data to Medicaid and managed care organizations, as well as initiated MCO pilot programs. And lastly, we were able to map Medicaid asthma data with environmental determinants and leverage funds from the Volkswagen Clean Air Act settlement to secure funds for HARP coverage for Medicaid-eligible children with asthma. We have continued to ensure that this parallel effort is aligned with the activities within the 618 initiative to create a synergistic approach to promoting community health workers and team-based care to use successes and demonstrated cost savings from the asthma home visiting models. 
So as I had just mentioned um, about our HARP infographic, this is a piece of the infographic, and if anyone is interested, I'd be happy to share. Um, so this infographic shows um, that we had developed a business case on HARP to show the cost savings and return on investment of the program. HARP has a positive return on investment, which means that for every dollar invested, we get returned with additional savings earned. HARP participants had a 33% return on investment on emergency department and hospital costs, so every $1 invested returned with an extra $0.30 cents saved. There have been several demonstrated outcomes for HARP, um, including quality improvement, improved asthma control, quality of life, reduction of environmental triggers, reduction of missed work and school days, and an increased use of asthma action plans for participants. This slide provides a breakdown of the median and average cost of care for children with asthma who are enrolled in Medicaid. As you can see, in 2016, children with asthma who were on Medicaid cost an average of $9,489, compared to children with asthma who were not eligible for HARP, who cost an average of $2,652. This breakdown of cost by HARP eligible population compared to those who are not eligible for HARP shows the importance of investing in this program. Basically, the HARP el eligible group has smaller numbers and has much higher costs for asthma care. On top of the uses of Medicaid asthma claims data uh, described, including the mapping, evaluation, and an economic analysis of asthma for ma managed care organizations, we also have used claims data for environmental policies such as sharing maps of asthma hotspots overlaid with public transit bus routes to help our sister agencies prioritize asthma hotspots for a zero emission bus electrification project. In the future, we will also be looking at housing instability and displacement within the Medicaid population. So that is the end of my presentation, and I have provided my contact information here if anyone's interested in learning more about our programs or receiving any of our materials mentioned during the presentation. And I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues here at the Rhode Island Department of Health Asthma Control Program, including Nancy Sutton, who's the PI of our CDC grant, Julian Drix, the program manager, and Deborah Perlman, our program consultant, uh, lead epidemiologist from Brown University. Thank you so much to the EPA and Tracy for giving us the opportunity to discuss our program, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Ashley. Again, um, Rhode Island is a great example of integrated healthcare services with an impressive ROI, and your important work with Medicaid is really um, uh, outstanding, and we could learn so much more from you. I'd uh, just like to end by thanking all of our um, speakers and congratulating our winners again. Uh, my thanks to them for taking the time to share their best practices and their experiences. And as you can see, we could have spent probably another hour um, learning from them. But the learning continues. Um, hopefully, you will be able to join us uh, immediately following uh, this presentation on Asthma Community Network. Dot org uh, to be able to interact directly with our uh, speakers and ask your questions at that time. Um, they're going to be with us till about 3.30, but this presentation as well as the question and answers will be archived on asthmacommunitynetwork.org, so you'll have the opportunity to go back and review um, and be able to ask questions in the future. Um, at this point, um, I would like to, uh, again, congratulate and thank our winners and uh, invite you to join us on asthmacommunitynetwork.org. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all.